historic floods. During a nationally televised weekly TV program on the Kenyan Broadcasting Corporation KBC Television Network that was aired on the 7th of August 2005, I began to proclaim the coming of historic tsunamis and floods upon the face of the earth. In that well-publicized television program, I once again reiterated that historic earthquakes like never seen before would have to strike the planet Earth in the event that the nations failed to repent and turn away from sin. In verbatim, that prophecy said, the Lord is going to shake half the planet Earth. Half of the Earth will shake tremendously because of this judgment, so that the dwellers of the Earth may know that when this happens, it is God who has caused it to happen. What else have I seen viewers? I asked. I have seen thy breed and destruction again. Oh, let me tell you this. In that 8 a.m. television program, I then further said, I have seen tremendous earthquakes coming to the earth. Very tremendous. Who tells the ocean where to stop? I have seen monumental floods coming to hit the earth again. Another level of floods. And then the Spirit of the Lord led me to further say that, I have seen tremendous death coming to the earth. Through it all, it emerged vividly obvious that this prophecy handed down to me by the angel of the Lord, was directly meant to reprove self-indulgence in all its forms. It is a prophecy that accepts the hospitality of all classes by paying a visit to all households, both the rich and poor, learned and the ignorant as it shakes and sees the peoples of the earth for the kingdom of God. Beneath this humongous prophecy was the luminous light of God in his total majesty of righteousness. For those who hearkened unto righteousness, they would see the compassionate Redeemer in this historic shake-up. Job 38, 7-8 says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors, when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb. Job 38 11. When I said, This far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. This is what essentially graduated the prophecy when I saw the historic floods of that vision and fearfully exclaimed to the nations, Who tells the ocean where to stop? Double edged sword. It was during the same period, while in Dodoma, Tanzania, that the Lord again spoke with me regarding this most horrific judgment that was coming to befall the nations of the earth. In a pastor's conference held in July 2005, in Dodoma, the Lord visited with me that night in a follow-up vision to that of July 11th. In the vision, God Almighty spoke with me in yet another stern conversation. At night, at the core of that vision, was the conviction that the gravitational center of man's relationship with the Lord rested on holiness. Going by that vision, I well understood it that in God's view, human understanding, trust, hope, service and worship, all indeed rested on the bedrock of morality, and a crisis in the latter spelled doom. What equally projected out clearly was the fact that God Almighty, Yahweh, is the great King over all the heaven and the earth, and one to whom all things must be subject. The cup of God during the vision, heaven opened, and I saw the person of the Holy Spirit descend all the way from heaven, down towards the earth. When he came from heaven, and had reached closer to me, I noticed that he was carrying a cup in his hands. The cup that the person of the Holy Spirit carried in that vision was a stunning white glorious cup. Then all of a sudden, I saw the person of the Holy Spirit turn that cup that was already full and poured its contents upon the face of the earth. It was then that the Holy Spirit came back again, and he handed me down the sword from heaven the sword that God the Holy Spirit placed in my hands, was a shocking most glittering sword, whose sharpness was razor thin. 
after which he asked me, What do you see happening with this sword? With a great longing to know, I looked at the sword that the Lord had handed me, and realized that it was a unique sword with two blades. As I held the sword of the Lord, I saw that it had four sharp edges that all converged at the handle. Then the person of the Holy Spirit came and touched the same spot on the handle, from where I held the sword. And then he asked in a loud voice, What do you see now? As I looked at the sword again, then the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Now the judgment of the Lord is coming to the nations of the earth, to the next level. His wrath because he alone is the sovereign God. Waking up from that tremendous vision, I realized that all the universe, the nations included, are indeed governed by his hand. I then went ahead to say in a Sunday August 2005 television broadcast, What do I see viewers? What do I see coming to you? You must understand that God is now going to bring destruction upon the face of the earth. And I said, I have seen historic war coming to the planet Earth. I have seen tremendous quakes, floods, tsunamis, wars and death coming to the planet Earth. In that television program I proceeded the viewership. Why is the Father showing me the wrath of his anger? His wrath is coming against the nations of the Earth. Because the altar of the Lord is broken and defiled. While the future of the godly into the kingdom of God was seemingly far rated by this prophecy, their protection thereof by the Lord is nevertheless guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Dwelling Place The Lord then again appeared to me in a mighty visitation two days later in the visitation of the Lord, the voice of Jehovah spoke and said, Look I have no a dwelling place. I am looking for a home and a dwelling place. That whole night the Lord talked to me about a dwelling place. I still remember that when I woke up and was very sad, I indeed felt the way the Lord himself had felt. He was very sad looking for a dwelling place. And that only meant that no one could be able to say to themselves that this is the temple of the Lord, for surely it was not the temple of the Lord anymore, because it was defiled. In the subsequent television programs, I was then compelled by the Holy Spirit to say, When the Lord looks at Australia, he sees sexual sin. Yet when he looks at Africa he sees sexual sin and witchcraft sweeping the continent of Africa. Heavy duty witchcraft upon the altar of the Lord. Asia bears the Eastern religion of Yoga, Hinduism, Buddhist, etc., etc. During those proclamations, it became very easy to recognize man's total dependence upon Jehovah, he who opposes the proud who rely on their own resources, that they have contrived. Contrarily, it immediately struck me that the humble, the poor and needy, who acknowledge their dependence on the Lord on all things, are the ones in whom God delights, hence would endear his protection upon this kind of ominous prophecy attests to the fact that pride yields disobedience and even though the proud may seem to prosper, God will bring them down to death, their final end. The postmodern earth and its inhabitants have been so proud to the Lord due to their civilization and modernization. The Show Cussing of the Tower of Babel Alternatively the humble who delight in the fear of the Lord, trusting in Him, and obeying His requirements, are indeed the wise before the Lord. The Lord in this prophecy portrays clearly that those who embrace the fear of the Lord will inherit the kingdom of God and that, not even death can hinder their seeing the face of God. Why the distress, the condition of man's heart? This most portentous July 11, 2005 visitation, presents what the postmodern world would term an affront to prosperity and human civilization. It is as though God Almighty was determined to demolish the big leap that man had scored in technological and infrastructural frameworks for comfortable and safe living in this day and age. 
Many may ask, why then would the loving God turn against mankind to such an order? The truth however is that Jehovah God in heaven had impatiently awaited the return of mankind Jeremiah 8 colon 4 8. As time passed by, and mankind did not appear, his suspicions were roused. The unwillingness of the shepherds to clearly point out on the matter of the Messiah's glorious return, seemed to indicate that they had penetrated God's design and had purposely avoided preparing for the coming of the Lord. The mere thought that his own creation could attempt to avoid the most momentous celebration of the cross at the marriage supper of the Lamb, undoubtedly maddened God. Hence, by sending this July 11, 2005 angel to make such ominous pronouncements, vividly paints a clear picture that reason had failed, but there was now left the resolve to godly force. Isaiah 1, 18-19 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 19 If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. With such pronouncements of a horrendous judgment in the horizon, it appeared that God Almighty had now decided to make an example of rebellious mankind. And they that were the haughty residents of this planet Earth should now see what they might expect in their attempt to place earthly prosperity and immorality on the throne. In what might serve as a perfect replay of tragedy, when Israel had similarly attempted to adorn a golden calf and place at his altar, it became a lasting controversy that saw many millions lose their lives, from the wilderness even unto this day. The present, day Church of Christ too, has fallen into this same tragedy, by attempting to enthrone that same earthly prosperity and promiscuity of this age, at his holy altar in the sanctuary. The Lord God Almighty, was indeed on this July 11th day, determined to send home the most important message, that at this hour, only the Messiah must be enthroned in the hearts of men. This calamity that the angel of the Lord was now decreeing on that July 11th 2005, mankind had brought it upon themselves. If only they had been walking in meek faithfulness and humility before the Lord, he would have, in a historic manner made the wrath of his end time virtue literally harmless to them. But they had separated themselves from God by their sin and they had rejected the Holy Spirit who was their only shield and defender. Even the Christians did not well perceive that it was their supercilious boast that the Messiah was to come as king to conquer. Hence, if the current global calamity and tragedy were anything to go by, then one can only imagine for themselves the level of destruction that the King of Kings will unleash upon the disobedient and proud enemies of God. Hebrew 10 26-31 Hebrew 6 4-6 They had not studied the scriptures with the desire to conform their lives to the will of God. Yet they have instead today searched for scriptures which could be interpreted to exalt and surround them with the intoxicating and promiscuous prosperity of this evil world. Through their gross misinterpretation of the word for selfish gain, God Almighty finally purposed to compass the destruction of their rising tower of Babel, which today we can clearly see, has turned upon their own heads. And this is the condition of man's heart that has caused unbearable agony in heaven. God Almighty is today speaking using the cruelty of these beginning of birth pains to affirm to mankind that if we have given our hearts to Jesus, then we should also bring our gifts of holy worship unto him. Put in perspective, the Holy Church of Christ is today being beaten by this overwhelming angel of the Lord in this vision. The night is nearly over and the church must now prepare in earnest that she might fulfill that which has been spoken of her by the prophets. Right now, 
the present day Christian faces an indomitable challenge to set mount in order to live a holy and separated life. This is owing to the admixture of spiritual foreigners that have dwelt with the church in a compromising Christian lifestyle. Through this monumental July 11, 2005 vision, God's grief at man's apostasy is unquestionably well evidenced. In this day and age, the Almighty Creator is seeking those Christians who can't fully submit their lives unto the overruling authority of the Holy Spirit. The example of Christ in linking himself with the interests of humanity would then be faithfully adhered to, for purposes of bringing the gospel of his grace to the perishing souls. As disciples of Christ, Jehovah God expects the church at this hour to have separated herself from mingling with the world for mere love of pleasure. Instead the Omnipotent expects that all Christian believers should become witnesses for Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify their social power using the grace of Christ in order to win souls into the kingdom. This is what will shine the light of Christ and withdraw Christian salvation from being viewed as an exacting religion. God Almighty indeed initially intended that mankind should present as partakers of his holy divine nature. The departure from this blueprint is unmistakably the root cause of this July 11, 2005 pronouncement of a controversy between the Creator and the creation. Being a last-minute ditch to reprove the Church and the nations, this landmark prophecy can in essence be termed God's last call of love. After 24 years of being crippled, God Almighty touched her. 24-year-old Margaret A. Taino was born crippled and lived all her life in a little humble village called Uzinj, by Lake Victoria, in western Kenya. In her condition, she was literally incapacitated since she could not walk, let alone getting up by herself. Margaret had already resigned to her condition knowing too well that nothing else could medically redeem her. However, when the meeting of the Lord was announced for Nyeri in central province of Kenya, precious Margaret saw a humongous opportunity to present her case before the Lord and try to see if the Lord could remember her. She made sure that she arrived at the Nyeri meeting promptly very early. Then come that Saturday April 16, 2011 when the prophet of the Lord walked into the stadium of the meeting and decreed that the cripples would get up and walk away that day. The power of God hit a Taino and slayed her to the ground. As she puts it in her own words, Nilishtakiti Unitatembia translated as when I woke up, I just got shocked that I could now get up and walk. The entire stadium went wild in jubilation for their God Jehovah had visited. Crippled for 60 wires. Born crippled, this man spent all the 60 years of his life on the floor, without ever being able to get up, let alone walking. However, when the power of the Lord descended at the mighty Nakuru revival meeting, this man was touched very heavily and when he woke up, he discovered that his crippled legs had been strengthened and that he could now get up alone and learn to walk for the first time in his life. It was big drama as this man gloriously stretched his first baby steps in life. Glory to God in the highest drama as very old crippled woman walks. There was absolute stun in the stadium as this very old crippled woman was touched by the Lord and totally slayed. The people that had brought her were absolutely very shocked to see her get up with her weak crippled legs and attempt to walk. To the stun of the entire stadium, she indeed managed to walk with her very deformed legs. Only later did everyone realize that her weak deformed legs had actually been strengthened by the power of the Lord that descended into the Raring Goo Stadium in Yeri. The multitude shouted hallelujah to the glory of the Lord, for what they had seen was a good thing to the eyes of men. The Lord had visited them.
unveiling the 2004 for warning. For a long time now, the precious people of Mexico had become so credulous to believe that a life spent in Catholicism, idol worship, sexual immorality and the witchcraft of Brujeria slash Chizaria could secure them a joyous and stable future. Moreover, the soaring phenomenon that has over the years excited the keenest of global interest on Mexico has been none other than the stunning tourist beaches she spots on both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. With all the awe of their beauties, these tourist resorts have unfortunately paid homage to a precipitous form of sexual immorality ever witnessed. Coupled with a tradition of an agnostic form of secularism, these aspects of the Mexican society have not only defined the texture of that nation, but also outlined its unique characteristic. Considering another yet most disturbing spectacle of human sacrifice that Mexico is involved in, all these aspects of sexual sin, witchcraft, and have simply presented as a mere harbinger that indicates on the level of decay in that land. The Pyramid of Cholula, popularly known as Pyramid de Cholula, has over the years prided herself as a focal point of convergence at which various witches congregate to observe an annual festival known as Dia de San Miguel. Such a day always fell on September 29th of every year, commonly referred to as Street Michael's Day. The morning indifference with which the church in Mexico turned to her own practices, in the midst of such a heinous sin, is what could have even enraged the jealousy of the most wicked of eighty hawk witches. Their act in the Catholic Church of Mexico indeed must have called forth no expression of joy at all in the heart of the Lord, but rather surprise, shock, mingled with utter unquenchable rage. The abomination that one runs into in some of the well-established Mexican cathedrals is such a detestable act that must have definitely wrenched God's heart to tatters. The placing of a huge monumental statue of an eagle with two heads is in itself a monumental act that undoubtedly cannot portray the worshipping of Jehovah. Such statues only befit the adoration of an evil monster at the altar of the Lord, whichever way one looks at it. How about the burial of priests and bishops at the altar of the Lord, where the children of Jehovah kneel down before the Lord and expose glass encasing of dried and immortalized corpses? While all this goes on, the Pentecostal and Evangelical churches that should have been the light in the nation of Mexico, have instead fallen to the temptations of the gospel of prosperity. With its appetites and worldly passions, this money-oriented preaching has largely appealed to the physical nature, and hence most effectual in corrupting and degrading worship in the sanctuary of Jehovah at the expense of acting a role of the rod of God in Mexico. Through its beguiling intemperance, the rampant gospel of prosperity in Mexico Pentecostal Church has destroyed the mental and moral powers of the gospel of the blood and the cross that God gave man in that land. A Priceless Endowment this is what has rendered the nation of Mexico a repugnant form of heathenism and caused the Catholic Church to get away with littering the land with huge statues right inside and on the rooftops of their churches. These are the large statues that have been molded to depict human appearance, and named after the celestial beings, to look like angels. With all this happening in Mexico, the land literally transformed herself into a regional hub of idol and satanic worship. Thus it became impossible for men to appreciate things of eternal worth. The uncontrolled indulgence and consequent disease and degradation that consumed Mexico was with such intensity of evil that could only be equitable with Sodom and Gomorrah before the floods. Every imagination of the thoughts and the hearts of the people became evil to the extent that an inexpressible anguish consumed those who feared that the wrath of God could one day befall. Out of the complacency of the church, 
Satan made the people of Mexico believe that they must sacrifice their conscientious convictions for idols and immorality. Instead of a strict adherence to Jehovah their Creator and His Righteous. If they had learned the power of God's Word, they would have followed the requirements of the Lord, and would not have followed the suggestions of Satan in order to obtain food or save their lives. Only one question would have mattered. What are the righteous requirements of the Lord? A contradiction would hence have never developed between the Lord God and Mexico. Why God Almighty shaved my head? When God Almighty saw that their return was not forthcoming, he decided to hold dominion over the state of worship in Mexico. That meant that he would now have to hold the people of Mexico to responsibility on worship. Considering that Christ Jesus had earlier come to disapprove Satan's claim over worship, in order that man may stand loyal to God, then this demonic adoration that was now thriving in that land, is totally uncalled for. In this way, the Son of Man had indeed scored the landmark victory that achieved an unparalleled milestone status in the life of man, that they may now worship Jehovah blamelessly. Going to this, God Almighty saw no reason whatsoever for man's loathsomeness in worshipping Satan and idols again, as was now occurring in Mexico. This is the sole reason as to why the Lord sent me to Mexico in that 2004, to awaken their souls on the fact that they had grossly misrepresented God, and very much misinterpreted his rights of worship, the Lord in that mission did not want his wrath to come upon them. Without a prior warning, lest men be led to fear God as one who delights in their destruction. Vision of Satanic Rituals in Monterey Upon arriving in the city of Monterey, the Lord led me to proclaim the need for a national repentance in Mexico, and especially within the church. The Lord Jehovah then began to speak to me in my divisions, and by his voice, about the whorehead state of sin and defilement in Mexico. It was then that I once got the opportunity to visit a suburb of Monterey called Guadalupe. While at Guadalupe, the Lord vividly spoke to me in a radical vision that would later change the entire state of the affair in Mexico. In the vision, I saw the communities that inhabited the mountains of Monterey. As I observed further on, the Spirit of the Lord highlighted the kind of worship that was ongoing on the mountain slopes. Key among the events that greeted the Lord in that vision, was the slaughtering of wild dogs as sacrifice to the devil. In the vision, the Lord specifically emphasized on how those communities gathered themselves to partake of that evil worship sacrifice as dogs were slaughtered. The Lord equally showed me the stones that were being laid down in building the altars for satanic worship. It was a blood sacrifice at which some portions were cremated as burn offering. The White Stones Following this disturbing vision of satanic worship on the mountain slopes, the God of Heaven led me to proclaim the first warning on Mexico. At a Sunday service in a church known as Iglesia Cristiana Aguaviva, I proclaimed to the people of Monterey on the need for Mexico to repent for defiling the altar of the Lord and the land set before them. However, that admonition did not come without the consequences of the failure to repent. The Lord clearly asserted at that Sunday service that a failure to repent would elicit his wrath upon the mountain slopes at which satanic blood sacrifices were being offered. In that Sunday service, I said that a failure to repent would cause the mountain slopes to shake violently, with huge boulders of white ice-like rocks rolling down from top to the bottom. And in that declaration, the Lord said, if you don't repent and turn away from the satanic blood sacrifices and idol worship, tomorrow by this time, there will be a severe quake shake those defiled mountain slopes and white stones will roll down. 
What became particularly most shocking that it took everyone by surprise especially that they were accustomed to the mellow preachings of prosperity and wellness. At that time no one in the church perceived the gravity of this prophecy at all. However, come the next day, Monday, the Lord indeed made good of his threat to shake the mountain slopes of Mandurai at which they had raised high places for devil worship. It was so severe that huge boulders of rock began to roll from the mountain slopes coming down and striking homes in the process. Such a phenomenon had never been witnessed in Mandurai, especially that the rocks were snow-white boulders. The news outlets were saturated with reportages on this unusual occurrence. Those that had listened to the prophecy being delivered 24 hours before its final fulfillment were shocked and dumbfounded at this act of God. This probably marked the beginning of what would later turn out to be a long-running controversy between the Lord God Almighty and the people of Mexico. It was a controversy that centered around the act of repentance. God had desired that the people of Mexico repent and be restored by his precious Holy Spirit. Such a restoration the Lord intended to ignite from the church. Vision of Leopard While those satanic rituals and abominable sacrifices went on, the Lord discerned a symbol of communion between wicked man and the devil. It became very apparent that the enemy had worked to blind the people of Mexico to these rites, that they may reject Christ at his glorious and most anticipated coming. It was about the same time while still at the suburb of Guadalupe, that the word of the Lord again came to me in a second vision. It was such a monumental vision to the extent that the Spirit of the Lord literally lifted me up, and took me onto a mountaintop and all across Mexico. It was while still in this vision, that I witnessed the most stunning episode of the conflict between good and evil. It developed into one of the most bruising conflicts I ever witnessed.